so true. It's so true that he loves us. And if you were here last week, you know that we opened up this series talking about good news for discouraged believers. Pastor Carmen was here, and uh, I'm so excited. Uh, I heard several people tell me that what a great job he did in, in sharing with you from God's Word. Uh, as he and his family are preparing to head out to Missoula, Montana, to plant a church. And so I'm so thankful that we had a chance to pray with him and pray over him and his family as they head out there. But it's cool to hear about this because the, the group of people that Peter's writing to are an incredibly discouraged group of people. Uh, maybe if you missed last week, we went over the first 12 verses of the book of 1 Peter. And in that context, we talked about three things that we need to remind ourselves of when we're discouraged. And, and if you weren't here, I'll just give them to you real quick. The first one is this, God chose you. As, as a follower of Christ, as a believer in Jesus, you have been chosen. Your salvation was no accident. God picked you. He wanted you. We also talked about last week, the second thing you need to remember when you're discouraged is that God is working on you. You are a work in progress. Okay, it's, it's road construction season. Has anybody noticed that? Okay, <laughs> it seems like. Um, but think about your life as an ongoing process. Not necessarily public works, but a private private works project where God is rewriting and rewiring your insides. He's working on you. Sometimes we forget that and we think we need to be a finished product. The reality is when you get discouraged, remember this, God's not done working on you. He's still working on you. It's an amazing truth. And then the last one is this. Pastor Carmen reminded us in the first 12 verses that God has secured an eternal future for you. When we get discouraged, we need to remember that this life, the life we're living, is temporal. It is temporary. And God has foreseen, he has secured your future. As a believer in Christ, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your, secure, your, your eternity is secure with him. And so I, I wanted to just review that because I think it's so important that we never forget the fact that all of that to say this, God loves you. If you hear nothing else that I say today, I want you to know that God loves you. He desperately loves you. So turn to someone and say, God loves me. God loves you. It's an amazing truth. And so we're going to jump in this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start in verse 13. And I'm just going to go ahead and read. And I'd ask for you, if you've got a copy of the Scriptures, go ahead and be writing, be underlining things that you hear. It's so important that when we read God's Word, we interact with it. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, you probably have a cell phone, I'm guessing. Okay. If you don't have a Bible or a cell phone, come see me after. I want to take a picture with you, okay? <laughs> Seriously. If you don't have a Bible, we'll help you get a Bible. If you don't have a cell phone, like, I want to get to know how you do that, okay? <laughs> You're my hero. All right? So here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and jump in, beginning in verse 13. Therefore, because of what has all been said, therefore... Keep, or excuse me, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, here's where it's going to get a little sticky this week. Check this out. Be holy yourselves. It's my Chris Farley moment here. Holy shnikes. <laughs> right? <laughs> holy smokes. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you." who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope 
are in God. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and, it's, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which is preached to you. It's a good word from Peter. It's a great word from him. And I want us to think about this message that he's sending to those Christians. In in verse 3 of that chapter, we didn't read it today, but he refers to those Christians as scattered aliens. See, we're being called in this passage as followers of Christ to live a life that is holy. And and I've, I've entitled the message today, Choosing to be Different. Would you agree that living a holy life is kind of different from the world in which we live? It's different, okay? In case you haven't noticed, uh, our world doesn't move down that path. Our, our, our world lives in a much different way. And so as Christians, we have different customs, norms, which should direct our lives. These alien tendencies that we don't have don't necessarily always show up right away. They don't outwardly express themselves It's rather an inward transition. It's an inward transformation. And so we're going to be talking about this idea of being alien, of being different throughout this message. Okay. Now, I I have to tell you, uh, for me, I grew up in a small town. Does anybody like me grew up in a small town? Some of you did. And so (coughs) there was 14 people in my graduating class. And I like to be different, but not different to be holy. I like to be different because, guess what? When I was in high school... There's one thing that I craved. You know what it was? <laughs> donuts. Yes. Uh, it was donuts. I cra- something I craved when I was growing up was attention. It was almost better than donuts. Because I liked it when people talked about me. Maybe you know some teenagers in your life that like attention. Maybe some of you still like attention. <laughs> so what I did was I would wear things to school that no other human being would wear to school. For instance, I, I, I think I coined this before Larry the Cable Guy did, but I got this deal of flannel shirts, and I cut the sleeves off. See, that was mine before Larry the Cable Guy. And I did that, why? Well, because I wanted people to draw, to draw attention. I would wear je- cut-off jean shorts with work boots. Okay? Now, I know that's cool now, uh, but back then nobody else was doing that. <laughs> and so I did that, why? Because to be holy, to be set apart... No, no, I did that because I wanted people to talk about me. I wanted attention. And as a senior in high school, I was rewarded for all of my silly behavior. Do you know what? During graduation, or during homecoming week, they had a day dress up like John Simchenko did. <laughs> it was the crowning achievement of my high school career. <laughs> but I was, di- and, I, and I still, I think I still am a little different. How many of you would say that sometimes you feel a little different? I do. <laughs> sometimes I feel different. I feel different. But we're talking about this idea about being in our world and yet not being of our world. See, what, what I did when I was in high school and what some of you maybe can relate to is not what we're talking about when we talk about this idea of holiness. We're, we're to be in this world but not of it. H- have you ever had a friend, uh, a sibling maybe, or a partner, husband, wife, someone close to you who had a area of the house or an area of their car that was completely off limits to everyone else maybe it was the man cave or a certain closet or the garage has has anybody ever had one of those friends okay where, where you knew that it very clearly you were not to touch anything in that room or in that space you guys have had you guys know something like that now if nobody if you're not raising your hand you might be that person okay (laughs) You might be that person who has that untouchable holy of holies, the, part, the place where no one else can go. Wh- whatever that might be, that's, that's kind of the idea that we're talking about. We're talking about 
being set apart. When we talk about being holy, in, in 1 Peter 1, 5, he says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. See, God wants us to be different. He's set us apart. He set us apart not for our own attention, but for his glory. And so I would invite you in your notes, if you have them, you can take them out. We've got that verse there. Maybe you want to circle the word holy. We're going to talk about that. It can be, a, it can be kind of a scary word, actually. Uh, it can be quite scary. In fact, it's hard even sometimes to think about holiness, but I want to just kind of preface a few things that we've talked about uh, because when we were on vacation, many of you know we went to, two weeks ago we went out to Minneapolis and then we went and spent a couple of days in the Wisconsin Dells. Now I had forgotten about this, but on the way to the Wisconsin Dells, there's a place called Black River Falls. And they have a quick trip there. I don't know why we don't have quick trips in South Dakota. Like it's the most amazing gas station in the world. They've got a grocery store, they've got all this cool stuff. They're quick trips, they're awesome. They're in Minnesota and Wisconsin, they don't seem to be anywhere else. But we stopped at this quick trip, and my boys had been in the car for a while, and so we walked in, we're walking around, and all of a sudden, my oldest, Lincoln, he kind of elbows Dana and says, look, look. And walking in the door was, was a, pers a, a person from the Amish colony wearing the hat, the boots, the whole Amish getup. And he says to Dana, he said, is he in a movie? He must be acting in a movie. And it kind of felt like that because here's this person dressed dramatically different than everyone else in the entire gas station. A little bit later, a couple came in, a young Amish couple came in. And, and sometimes I think, you know, for him, he'd never seen anything like that. On our way home, we were driving under this over, uh, we were driving under the overpass on the interstate and we saw a horse and buggy go over the interstate. We were deep in Amish country. And what's interesting about that for me is that so many times I think the church and people think about holiness in an external form. See, see my wife and I have been talking about this now, about becoming Amish. She's really excited about it. Um, <laughs> I think it'd be kind of cool. I read an article about a, a couple that did that. They, they became Amish. But, but here's, here's the reality. We think about holiness as what you see on the outside, don't we? I mean, let's just be honest. When you hear the word holiness, you think about somebody that's perfect, that's untouchable, that's perfect. And, and, and that's how we think about it. But there's some things that I want to share with you that, that I believe God has been sharing with me recently. And these, these aren't in your notes, but these might be helpful thoughts for you. Holiness is not a destination. It's a gradual transformation. You can't externally become holy. Holiness is a choice of disposition rather than a reaction to your circumstances. See, in Christ we are made new. We've been set apart by Him and by His blood. We are children of God, and our identity has the power to influence our behavior. You see, what's different about us is our identity isn't in the world. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. That makes us different. It makes us different. Here's another thing that I've learned about holiness. It's not something we live for, but rather holiness is something we live out. See, if you are truly growing in holiness, one of the things that you will hear is people will notice things in your life that you don't even know are happening. Over time, as God begins to work on you and he begins to work in you, people around you will start noticing things and you're like, really? I didn't know that. You can't manufacture holiness. It's not an external thing. We don't live for it. It's not a goal. It's a fruit. It's a result of the work that God is doing in you. Here's the last thing that I just wanted to share. Holiness does not necessarily mean doing anything different. Although it might mean doing some things different. It doesn't necessarily mean doing things different, although that will be a result. Rather, holiness is learning a new way of being. Holiness is learning and expressing a new way of life. It's a lifestyle with God made possible through a relationship with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I'm so proud of in our church is our children's ministry. Our children's ministry does a fantastic job. 
They do a fantastic job of communicating God's eternal truth in ways that kids can get it. This summer, they're walking through all the fruits of the Spirit. If you have kids or you know kids, uh, we, we don't do a, a traditional VBS here. We just don't do it. I, I, I've been asked that question. I'm not going to explain all of the reasons, but one of the reasons is, is because every single Sunday, we have an incredible VBS experience for our kids just, just in our children's area. And this summer, they're learning about the fruits of the Spirit. They're learning about this idea. And, and the fruit of the Spirit, the idea is this, it's something that we can't do for ourselves, it's something that's done in us. It's not about the outside, it's about the inside. And so why holiness, why is it so important? It, it's not about me. And here's the truth, it's not necessarily about you. Holiness, the reason it's so important, the reason we talk about it, is because it's all about God. It's about leading a lifestyle that's pleasing to Him. It's His work, and He's doing it in us. With that being said, it's also going to require some intention on our part. And so I want to give you what I'd like to call a few holiness life hacks about how we can live different. Okay, so if you have your notes, we're going to fill these in. There's a few things that we can do. Peter tells us the first one, this. He says, prepare your minds for action. Here's the first one. If you want to grow in holiness, if you want to see those fruit lived out in your life, here's the first one. Slow down and think clearly. Slow down and think clearly. Now, if you want to be different in our world today, slow down. <laughs> because everybody's moving at a breakneck speed. If you want to be different in our world today, think. So few people in our world do that. Th that's where we start. Slow down and think clearly. Everyone's heard this. What were you thinking? Has anyone ever heard that? Say, okay. I, I love that because it's, it's silly. Because the, the re reaction, the, the answer is literally this. Well, you weren't thinking. <laughs> what were you thinking? Well, you probably weren't. You, you've probably heard this, that an idle mind is the devil's playground. Have you heard that? Well, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people in our world today who I think are just idling through life. They're just kind of putting along. They're living idly. They're thinking idly. We live in a society that's biblically illiterate. We struggle because we don't know what God's Word says. We have God's Word why aren't we accessing it? Why aren't we taking our minds and focusing on it? slowing down, thinking clearly? We, we live to this beat so often. Instead of thinking and slowing down, we so often live by our emotions. We let our emotions, if it feels good, that must mean that we should do it. That's the world that we live in. I was, I was talking with someone this week and they said a book they were reading and said this, the word emotions comes from the word that means to move away. So what do emotions do? Most times, emotions move us away from God. They move us away from His will for our life. And so the Bible tells us instead of chasing our emotions, we need to stop and engage our brains. We need to engage our brains. Romans says this, be transformed by the renewing of our what? We need to be renewed by the or transformed by the renewing of our minds. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. You see, this is one of the problems that we have in our world. And, and I know we live in a very well-educated part of the world. But a problem that we have is ignorance. We don't know what this says. We don't know what God has revealed to us. We need to slow down. We need to think clearly. Okay? So you want to be different? Slow down and think. That will make you different all by all of it in, in itself. Here's the second one. And this one's really going to set you apart in our world today. Are you ready for this one? If you want, if you want to grow in holiness, if you want to be different, do this. Sober up. Okay? <laughs> Sober up. 1 Peter uh, verse 13 says, So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the special blessings that will come to you 
at the return of Jesus Christ. The word self-control here, other translations have it translated as sober up. So so next to sober up, go ahead and write in self-control. If you know your scriptures, you know that self-control is actually one of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? It's self-control. We need to be disciplined in how we live. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade, but we, meaning followers of Christ, do it for an eternal prize. Titus says this way, we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with self-control, right conduct, and devotion to God. We need to slow down, think clearly, and we need to sober up. Now, I'm going to address that for just a second because I think it's important. I'm in a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And most of the time, by the time I get involved in the conversation, there's been a series of poor choices. Okay. And this is just with my own family. Okay. <laughs> but, but seriously, as a pastor, over the last 12 years, I've had many conversations with people where they're in a situation that seems somewhat irreconcilable. Things have gone off the tracks. Things are going bad. And usually, there's a series of choices that lead up to that moment. Do you know what I find, in, and I can't say every case, but nearly every case, at some point in that series of poor choices, alcohol is involved. Okay. I, I can speak to you from my own life. I was cleaning out some boxes uh, in, our, in our house. We were moving some things around. And I found evidence in my own life of what happens when alcohol is your focus. Okay. It was, a, it was a, a, a court document to appear in court for minor in possession. Okay. I was 18. I had everything figured out. And what was driving me? A good time. <laughs> so I, I would say this. I'm not going to say, and I, this, is, this, is a sta- this is actually a statement. I'm making this statement. If you're drinking alcohol, here, here's my encouragement to you. I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong. I'm not going to tell you you can't do it. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Slow down and think clearly about the frequency and the quantity. Okay? Got a lot of blank stares looking at me. (laughs) I've had to do that. As Rodney Dangerfield would say, the hard way. Okay? It's been hard for me. I'm not a quick learner, but I've learned Because when I slowed down and really thought about it, personally, for myself, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. I've seen too many lives, I've seen too many things go sideways, go completely upside down when alcohol is involved. So, So understand, sober up doesn't mean just alcohol, but I don't want you to miss this. If you're gonna choose to make alcohol a part of your life, Here's my encouragement to you. Think and slow down. Think and slow down. Because it can have drastic implications. Everything else, the other things, sex, food, entertainment, all of the other pleasures of this world apply the same thing. What is it that you're taking in? What is it that you're consuming? Slow down and think. Slow down and think so that you can make good decisions. This is the path to holiness. We're not there yet, because the last one is this, number three. This is probably the most important. You need to fix your hope. You need to fix your hope. The key word is the word fix. It's what you focus your attention to. You see, so oftentimes we tend to, to waffle in circumstances. There's pressures. That's why we go fast, that's why we don't think, and that's why we get wasted, because we're in a hurry. And we want our problems, we want our boredom to go away now. It's because our hope isn't fixed on Jesus Christ. Our hope is fixed on this world. It's where we get off track. And so here's the key to sobering up. It was my key to sober up. Here's the key to slowing down and thinking clearly. We need to fix our hope. Where is your hope fixed? Is it fixed 
on Jesus Christ? Is it fixed on Jesus Christ? Hebrews 12, 2 says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, if you have a desire, if you want to grow and you want to be different in this world, it begins with number three. You need to settle the issue of your hope. Is your hope in this world? Is it in a relationship? Is it in a career? Is it in a home? Is it in anything that this world provides? Or is your hope in Jesus Christ? And I'd like us to just take a moment right now. Maybe you've asked this question before. But in this moment and in this time, we can receive that. So we're going to slow down for a minute. If you're comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes. And we're going to just pray. And you can join me in this prayer if you want. And we're going to fix our hope on Jesus. This isn't something we're going to do outwardly. It's something we need to do inwardly. By slowing down. By thinking. In a very sober manner. Is Jesus where you have your eyes fixed? Is your hope on Jesus or is your hope on something else? Father, I pray that for each person here in this moment, that before they leave their chair, that they would have an honest moment, Father, of reflection, of thinking deeply on where their hope is fixed. Father, I pray that every person in this room would see, would experience the peace, the joy that results, the confidence, the clarity that comes when our hope is fixed on your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that for every person in this room. If there's anyone here right now that is ready to say, Hey, my hope is fixed on Jesus. Is there anyone here that would be willing to raise their hand and say, my, my hope, it ain't perfect, but it's fixed on Jesus. I, I have moments. Is there anyone here that would say that? Thank you. There's lots of hands going up. You see, this is where we need to be. You can open your eyes. I forgot to say amen, but we, we need to be able to say it. Okay? If you're not there yet, that's okay. My hope, my prayer is that you wouldn't leave this place without giving it serious consideration. Because I've, uh, well, I haven't been around the world. I've been around South Dakota. <laughs> there ain't any place I want to put my hope other than in Jesus. I, I've tried some other places. And it, it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't bring peace. It doesn't bring peace. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Now here, the last two, I want to, I want to close with these two. Because here are two of the fruits of being different. Here are two of the things that you're going to experience in your life that others will begin to notice when you begin to say, I want to be different. You slow down, you think, you sober up, and you fix your hope on Jesus. Here's some of the things that are going to happen. The first one is this, obedience. Verse 22 says, since you have an obedience to the truth which has purified your soul. If there's anything in our lives that gets us in trouble... It's disobedience. Okay. How many, do you have any parents here? Okay. Do most problems begin in homes with the kids disobeying what the parents have said? Am I the only parent that experiences that? Okay. I'm sure my parents said the same thing about me. <laughs> okay. Disobedience is a huge problem. What's going to happen when we are being different and we're growing in holiness is obedience is going to come out. It's going to come out. I mean, God's word says it all the time. It says things like this. Don't take my name in vain. But so many times you may choose to do that. God says keep the Sabbath day holy. But we don't. We, we think we can get by with that. The list of things is endless. Holiness is discovered and observed through obedience to his word. That doesn't mean you have to be a Bible scholar. It just means you have to obey the things that you know and keep seeking the things that you don't. 
We follow God in obedience. That's what holiness is about. Here's the second thing that it's about. It's about love. Go ahead and fill that in. Peter says, fervently love one another from the heart. There's no better test for being different and growing in God's will for your life than how you love. There's no better test. Jesus would would say it this way. He he literally calls it the litmus test for being a Christian. He's with his disciples in the upper room, and he, he says this in John 13, Others will know that you are my followers by the love you have for one another. You see, Jesus is giving his disciples a challenge. Do you want the world to know? Then you need to love one another. That's the fruit of growing in Christ. It's the fruit of holiness, of being different. It's love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, the greatest of these, he's talking about faith, he's talking about hope. What does he say the greatest is? It is. It's wedding season now, isn't it? We always say that, you know, the the love chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. It's love. The greatest of these is love. There's a story about a pagan man in the first century. He went out to report on the early church movement. As we heard last week, these were the kind of pushback that the early Christians got. But this pagan man went out to report on the early church movement. His goal was to write something bad and derogatory about the Christian movement. But upon coming in contact with these Christians, he wrote six words that impacted the entire whole of church history. This is, remember, a pagan person. These were his words. Behold how they love one another. Behold how they love one another. I wonder what would be said if that same person came into our church and into our community. Would he say that about us at Celebrate? Behold how they love one another. Would that be true for us? I've I've got to push back and I've got to ask us this question. Are we experiencing that fruit of love in our lives, in our homes, in our church? Do people from the outside see us as different not because of what we wear, but because of how we love? I, I, yesterday I had the opportunity, uh, my wife was working, Lincoln was at a friend's house, and so Andy, Andy broke his leg um, again. Um, <laughs> you can be praying for my son, he seems to be breaking down a lot <laughs> in the last year. So we're kind of chilling, it's, it's pretty hot out, so we were chilling, so I just turned on uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. And of course, those of you that are growing in holiness know that it's the movie Hoosiers. Okay. It's the best movie ever, like, conceived. Anybody Hoosiers fans here? Now, I don't know why I love it so much. I think it's the David versus Goliath thing. But one of the things I love is how Coach gives Shooter a chance. And even when he messes up, he keeps giving him another chance. You see, Shooter, he lives in the past. Spends most of his time at the bar, getting drunk. He's isolated from his family. His own son is on the team, but they have no relationship. And so Coach, at a point when he he could have lost his job very easily, he chooses to do what? He chooses to risk. And he chooses to love Shooter. Now, does Shooter get it always right? No. He blows it. He blows it big time. One of my favorite parts about that movie is when when his son comes comes to Coach, his dad. He says, Coach, I just don't get what you're doing with my dad. And then at the end, in the hospital, his son comes back and says to Shooter, Dad, we're going to get a place together. You're going to get better. I love that part of the movie because what does Coach do? And he's got his own stuff, doesn't he? He's got a secret that he's trying to keep. But what does he do in that moment? He chooses to love. What if we became the church that chose to love, even those people that no one else loved? What what if we 
were seen to be the church that loved the drunks in our community? What if we were attracted to the people that no one else was attracted to? What if when people thought of our church, they thought of a church that loved people? No strings attached. See, that's the fruit of holiness. That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be different. We love people that no one else would dare to love. Let me ask you a question. Are you loving people the way Jesus loved people. Behold how they love one another. And I love how Peter closes this. He says this, the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word to which it was preached. I'm going to conclude in a moment, but I just want to pray, and then I'm going to invite some friends to come up. Let's pray. Father, we need you. I know for me, I, I can get drowned sometimes in my own selfishness, wrapped up even times in, in moments of self-righteousness. Father, I, I confess today that I think more about myself than I do even about my own family. And Father, I, I repent of that. I, I turn from that. I don't want to be that person. I want to be someone who's known for obedience to your word and for a radical love of people. That's who I want to be. Father, help me to slow down, to think clearly, to evaluate my behavior. Father, I, I ask by your Spirit that you would fill me with self-control, that I would live sober, not moment to moment. And Father, I pray once again that you renew in me and renew in all of us a fixation your son Jesus and we may fix our eyes and fix our hope on your son Jesus I pray this in Jesus name